Ever wondered what is meant by the divine right of kings? Want to get extra context marks in your Macbeth essays? Stay tuned. The divine right of kings is basically the idea that God chose the person on the throne. They are sitting on that throne because God decided, before the monarch was even born, that this person was the right person for the job. They're made in the image of God and will rule the country on God's behalf. Or so they say. History. The idea of the divine right of kings has existed for centuries. The Romans mentioned it, people before the Romans mentioned it. But the idea was popularised by Henry VIII. Henry VIII had a few relationship problems and wanted to get a divorce. The Pope said that he couldn't get divorced as this wasn't allowed in the Catholic Church. So Henry split off from the Catholic Church, created the Church of England and declared himself the supreme head of this new religion. Now this was quite a sudden change. You've got a country full of Catholics who have spent their entire lives believing that God chose the Pope and God works through the Pope. So to make himself seem more legitimate, Henry started referring to the divine right of kings. The idea that God chose him and that God works through him. And it seemed to work for Henry. By the time he died, a lot of the country was Protestant. About 60 years later or so, Henry's daughter Elizabeth dies and leaves no heir. So they get James VI of Scotland to become James I of England and Scotland. But a lot of people didn't believe in him. They thought there were better choices to be king. They thought he was illegitimate. So what does James do? He trots out the old divine right of kings. He tells everyone that God chose him to be king, so he must be the right choice. If we want to get specific, in a speech that he gave, he said, and this is a quote, The status of a monarch is the supreme status on this earth. For kings are not only God's lieutenants on earth, sitting on the throne of God, but God himself calls them gods. As it is blasphemous to discuss the works of God, so it is seditious on the part of the people to discuss what a king can do. I do not accept that my power be discussed. Essentially, he says, if you go against me, you're going against God. And again, it seemed to work for him. He ruled for over 20 years until his death from an illness, and it's reported that generally the public liked him. Gunpowder plot aside. So where does the divine right of kings pop up in Macbeth? It comes with Duncan's kingship, but also with Macbeth's too. Now we know that the king is appointed by God, yet Macbeth is appointed by the witches in this quote, seen by many to be instruments of the devil. Maybe that explains why Macbeth's rule doesn't last very long in the play. In this quotation, Lady Macbeth is thinking out loud to herself after reading Macbeth's letter and the world holily tells us that she thinks Macbeth wants to wait around for divine intervention to make him king, for God to decide that Macbeth is in line and for Duncan to die. But Lady Macbeth is far too ambitious and far too impatient to wait that long. Then you have Macbeth's doubt about killing the king. When talking about Duncan being so good, so in God's favour, he mentions that the country will be crying for him and mourning for him. But he uses imagery of angels and damnation of hell to do this. After Macbeth kills the God-appointed king, he loses his own relationship with God, almost as if God has abandoned him. And then you have some of the reactions to Duncan's death. All of the religious imagery in Macduff's speech to show Duncan's relation to God. A bit of double meaning on this one. Murder hath broke ope the Lord's anointed temple. Is this talking about Duncan's head, his temple that had been touched by the hand of God? Or is it a metaphor for the kingship, something that should be protected, revered, even worshipped like a religious temple? Either way, it's clear that Macduff makes the link between the king and God. And another reaction to Duncan's death, but this one from Mother Nature, showing her displeasure at the death of Duncan. People at this time, being a superstitious bunch, thought that nature would be disturbed and terrible things could happen if God was angered. And murdering God's lieutenant on earth probably could class as something that would anger God. It's reported that on the death of the real life King Duncan, there was darkness for six months, all because somebody tried to meddle with the divine right of kings and interrupt the great chain of being. So maybe Macbeth was so hesitant to kill King Duncan because he believed in the divine right of kings. And maybe that's why Macbeth yearns for absolute power and control. He seems to believe that just because he has the crown, people should respect him. He believes he is God's lieutenant on earth, and therefore people should obey him. 
Now, he might have the crown, but he does not have the divine right to be king. And maybe that's why he starts to be referred to as the usurper, Black Macbeth, butcher, villain, abhorred tyrant, devil, fiend, and more. And then order is restored at the end of the play when Malcolm is crowned king. When Duncan's divine bloodline is restored to the throne, that's when we're supposed to get the idea that things are back to how they should be. And we get that sense of catharsis, that relief. So Shakespeare seems to be backing King James up in his claims of his divine right to be king. This play is basically a theatrical manifestation of the divine right of kings. It's a bit of propaganda, a bit of king flattery to push the idea that the king was chosen by God and to warn that nobody should question it. If they do, if they interfere with the divine right of kings, then nature itself will be disrupted. They'll end up the same as this dead butcher and his fiend-like queen. Because as James makes out, going against the king is the same as going against God. Thanks for watching. I hope you found that one useful. Happy revising.